Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out with Earl Lloyd, who died recently at the age of 86. He was the first black player in the NBA. They like to call him the Jackie Robinson of basketball. I'm not crazy about that. It's sort of a cliche, and it diminishes Earl Lloyd's accomplishments in his own right. Here's an NBA report on the groundbreaking career of Earl Lloyd. Earl Lloyd became the first African-American to play in an NBA game. Lloyd, drafted in the ninth round of the 1950 draft by the Washington Capitals, played nine NBA seasons. Lloyd scored over 4,600 points during his career, including winning the 1955 NBA championship with the Syracuse Nationals. Lloyd and teammate Jim Tucker would become the first African-American players to win an NBA championship. In 1968, he became the first African-American bench coach with the Detroit Pistons. He would later become the second African-American head coach in NBA history, coaching 77 games for the Pistons. In 2003, Earl Lloyd was inducted into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame as a contributor. Earl Lloyd was once asked who the NBA player he admired the most was, and he said Charles Barkley. And here's the ESPN crew, Charles, Kenny Smith, Shaq, and Ernie Johnson talking about Earl Lloyd. When I met him, it was really cool. The older black guys, I have so much admiration and respect for them. Because just playing basketball is hard enough, but I couldn't imagine all the mental stress that those guys were under. Like, just playing basketball in its own right is stressful. But I couldn't imagine all the civil rights stuff that they had going on. We can't stay in the same hotel. We can't eat at the same places. And, you know, people screaming stuff. But then have to block that out and go actually play basketball. You know, I told you, one of my heroes is Joe Morgan. He said when he met Jackie Robinson, he said he just wanted to say thank you. And when I met Mr. Law, like I said, when I see Coach Thompson and Bill Russell and all guys – those older black men who played the game, I always tell them, thank you, Spencer Haywood, Wes Unsell, you know, guys like that. Man, I just tell them thank you because the men they had become, because uh, Mr. Lloyd was just such a nice man also. Being from Alabama, everybody know about all the BS that went on through the racial history, Dr. King, Selma, and everything like that. I've always felt that my entire life. But if it wasn't for basketball, basketball was the first time in my life that I ever interacted with, with white people and felt like we can actually get along and there's not all this animosity and hatred, all this stuff going on. That's one of the reasons I always tell people, man, I thank God every day for basketball because uh, it opened my mind up. Uh, it, it opened my mind up to, to, to get together with other races that I, even when we still were segregated in Alabama, living in different neighborhoods, I, that's one of the reasons I really love basketball because it opens up so many doors like this situation we're talking about now. You can only admire them no matter what race, creed, or color you are. You can only admire people who have done things that are groundbreaking like Earl Lloyd. You know, I've got a chance to talk to Bill Sherman, who was a teammate of, of, of Earl Lloyd, and he told me some wonderful things. So, you know, thank you to all the pioneers that have paved the way for young African-American men. Pioneer, NBA champion, legend Earl Lloyd passes on at the age of 86. Nice tribute from the ESPN guys. The kids should listen to them. We're going to move on now to our feature. The Reverend Theodore Hesburgh was the president of Notre Dame from 1952 to 1987. Reverend Hesburgh died recently at the age of 97, and he not only transformed Notre Dame, but for a half a century, he was one of the leading religious figures in the United States. Here's Walter Cronkite narrating a feature on the Reverend Theodore Hesper. Visitors to the University of Notre Dame often pause before the east door of the Basilica of the Sacred Heart. The inscription there reads, God, country, Notre Dame. It honors alumni who died in World War I. To generations of graduates, these words have come to define the university. In particular, they describe the career of its president emeritus, Father Theodore Martin Hesburgh of the Congregation of Holy Cross. Hesburgh came to Notre Dame as a newly admitted PhD in 1945. He was to teach theology and serve as chaplain to veterans of another war. He went on to serve as Notre Dame's president for more than three decades, transforming the university academically before retiring in 1987. One of the longest and most distinguished tenures in American higher education. 
His 150 honorary degrees speak to the impact he had on the fields of education and religion, but his many honors also underline a remarkable career in public service, one that has made him one of the most influential priests of his time. His presence on the national scene began with President Dwight Eisenhower. The president was looking for someone from the humanities to serve on the National Science Board. He appointed Hesburgh in 1954. Hesburgh proved to be a good listener, a team player who did his homework, a person who could disagree without being disagreeable. Word spread about this young bright priest, and over a span of a half century, Hesburgh served on some 150 advisory bodies, 16 of them at the behest of a sitting U.S. president. At one point, a Washington Post columnist observed, for a few perilous moments last month, the federal government was left dangling without the services of the Reverend Theodore M. Hesburgh. He gave priority to issues that had moral overtones, civil and human rights, third and fourth world development, immigration and refugees, nuclear proliferation. Unless you do outside things, he once said, you run out of gas. I only take on things where I think I can bring some fruit back to campus. Hesburgh got to know several of the nation's chief executives as he became a familiar face in Washington. Presidents sought him out for challenging assignments. He tackled third rail issues like clemency for Vietnam offenders and immigration reform. In recognition of his contributions to the Commonwealth, President Lyndon Johnson gave him the nation's highest civilian honor, the Medal of Freedom. Hesburgh often invited occupants of the White House to Notre Dame. He honored me in my first year in the White House by inviting me to Notre Dame when human rights was becoming the foundation of our foreign policy. And it's a kind of contribution that he's made to many other leaders, and of course he's a leader himself. Hesburgh's crowning achievement in public service was as a member of the Civil Rights Commission from 1957 to 1972. During his last three years, he served as its chair. His tenure included the historic 1960 civil rights legislation in education, housing, and jobs that broke the back of segregation in America. He once wrote, I do not care if the U.S. gets a man on the moon, if while this is happening, we on our corner of the earth nurse our prejudices and flout our beloved Constitution. We should take this stance for human dignity because it is right and any other stance is wrong. When the mayor and archbishop of Chicago turned down invitations to a Martin Luther King rally in their city, Hesburgh drove up from South Bend to link arms with the civil rights leader. The key to the success of the civil rights movement was to keep it from being a radical leftist movement and recognize that it was truly a movement coming out of the Judeo-Christian U.S. constitutional tradition of justice. Well, nobody could represent all of those forces like Father Ted could. And he did it in such a quiet, unassuming, non-judgmental way that when he was with you, you didn't have to worry about who was against you. The leverage of the Civil Rights Commission for Social Change was the public spotlight, and not every president enjoyed being in it. With Hesburgh presiding, the commission began giving out report cards on how well the federal government was advancing civil rights. The administration of Richard Nixon received failing grades, and after his re-election in 1972, the president forced Hesburgh's resignation. There's hardly anything I've done that didn't have a relationship to justice or human rights or peace. Conversant in five languages, Notre Dame's president was something of a world citizen. He wrecked up more than two million miles, visiting more than 130 countries. He concentrated on the global issues of poverty and hunger. He often described Earth as a spaceship on which 25% of its passengers consume 80% of its resources. There were many jobs for Hesburgh over the years, but only one identity, that of a priest. In presenting him with the Congressional Gold Medal, President Bill Clinton put it this way. All of your friends, the people who have known you over the years, and admired everything you've done for civil rights and world peace and for Notre Dame, say that the most important thing about you and the greatest honor you will ever wear around your neck 
is the collar you have worn for 57 years. I want to conclude by thanking God that I could be born an American, thanking God that I could live during these years and be inspired by so many wonderful people, including many of you out there, to live in a country where you can honestly work for justice and people give you cheers, in a country where you can dream and where you can see it grow in beauty and goodness. I mentioned Reverend Hesburgh transformed Notre Dame. Here he talks about it in a luncheon speech he gave as President Emeritus. But I have to say that of all the things that I might have done that were worthwhile, the putting of Notre Dame under lake control and the opening of Notre Dame to women are the two most important, I think, and the two most fruitful things that I ever did during those years. And other things kind of pale beside them. And the fruit of the second thing is the fact we're sitting here today at a Notre Dame party, which everybody are women, except me and maybe a few waiters. I have to tell you, it does my heart good because the experiment was right. Many others followed as they had on going under lake control. Many others followed in our footsteps. I think we are a much healthier place today. We're certainly a more intellectual place today. We're certainly a more cultural place today. And I have to say we're a better place today because about 50% of our students today are women. We're going to close tonight with Irving Kahn, who was known as the oldest investor on Wall Street. He probably was. He died at the age of 109. Here's an interview with him when he was a young man of 103. Wall Street, 80 years ago. Know who is there? Irving Kahn. When were you born? December 19, 1905. He rang the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange on his 100th birthday six years ago. How has Wall Street changed during your life? Well, when I got to the street in 28-9, it was much more a rich man's game. Not that I was rich, but I mean it was designed for banks or insurance companies or railroads public utilities. It's no longer a rich man's business. It's a business for everybody. Do you still watch the stock market very closely every day? Well, I have the uh, Bloomberg, which is right here. I don't watch it because I'm not a trader. You're a value investor. Right. And I stick to 20 odd stocks that I hold. I was very lucky being born in 95. I was just in time for a lot of the new technologies, radio, television. Do you have a cell phone now? Yes, I do. What do you think is to thank for your father's longevity? He works every day. Well, I would say that the fact that he has an office to go to and a job and responsibilities is extremely important. I'm going to read in a little bit of an interview you did with Bloomberg a couple years back. No two recoveries are alike. When I came to Wall Street in 1928, I thought the market was crazy. It hit the brakes in 29. You have to be careful to distinguish between one recovery and the other. You stick to value, to Benjamin Graham, the man who wrote the Bible for the market. It's a mistake to believe you can do more, I warn you. John Maynard Keynes was one of the most famous economists in history. He was a genius, but he was a failed macro investor. It was hard to believe at the time, but when he became a bottom-up value guy, well, he became very successful. With value investing, you don't have to bend the truth to accommodate periods with derivatives and manias. Value investing will almost always be right. I've seen a lot of recoveries. I saw crash, recovery, World War II, a lot of economic decline and recovery. What's different about this time is the huge amount of quote-unquote information. So many people watch financial TV at bars and the barbershop. The superfluity of information, all is static in the air. There's a huge number of people trading for themselves. You couldn't do this before 1975 when commissions were fixed by law. It's a hyperactivity that I never saw in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. A commission used to cost you a hell of a lot. You couldn't buy and sell the same thing 16 times a day. You say you feel recovery, your feelings don't count. The economy, the market, they don't care about your feelings. Leave your feelings out of it. Buy the out of favor, the unpopular. Nobody can predict the market. Take that premise to heart and look to invest in dollar bills selling for 50 cents. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and former trader Sid Tepps. Well, Irving Kahn shorted the market during the crash of 1929 and doubled his money. So in honor of him, we're going to play Ginger Rogers' famous song from the Gold Diggers of 1933. 